Evening, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Thank you for coming out for our panel. Uh, panel summary is today we're going to talk about um, what does it look like to have uh, native thinking for uh, telecommunications? Um, I'm joined today with, uh, with our guests. I don't want to call them just our guests. I want to call them the experts in our in a, in a field here. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Fred Couts. Uh, introduce them. Uh, for me, yeah, raise your hand, please. Thank you. And then the next person is uh, Watson. Um, he's coming from us from Volk. And uh, Jeffrey Salines, Salines. I apologize for messing up that name. We just had that discussion. I apologize. So let's get started here. Uh, let's let's talk about some some basics here. Let's open up with some principles to uh, for cloud native when it when referring to cloud native and also referring to cloud native when we're talking about uh, referring to telecommunications. Let's start with Watson here. Um, why is there so much confusion about what cloud native entails? Oh, okay, so as far as cloud native, let's say um, people were confused even just eight years ago about what cloud meant. And so now you have a new uh, buzzword, cloud native, and that, you know, thrown on top of what cloud even means, which is originally just meant um, elasticity and um, um, virtualization and being able to use that uh, virtualization in an elastic manner. I think it was coined by Werner Vogel of um, the CTO of Amazon. So uh, it, it really just uh, stacked on top of that confusion. Um, and then also as far as just marketing buzzwords go, you know, people want to stretch concepts to uh, fit their bidding. So that's really why I think some of the confusion comes in. Um, but there's a history uh, that uh, lent itself and uh, built up into the cloud native. Um, so we can probably get more into that, but um, maybe some other people might want to uh, join in or chime in on that. Well, this is open. Um, Frederick, any thoughts on uh, some of the confusion that you have seen or heard or even work with in terms of uh, what it means to have to be cloud native? Sure. So part of what part of what's uh, happening is we've seen a progression in time. Um, it's really started earlier than than uh, Docker, but Docker was a major accelerator of this. And uh, initially, there was this push to let's go put things in the cloud. And if I have something that fits in a container, I can put it in a the cloud. Then does that make it cloud native? When we say cloud native, we don't necessarily mean that it just runs in the cloud, but it's been designed for the properties that Watson just mentioned. That it's designed to make use of that elasticity, to make to make use of uh, of having of microservices and, and that architecture, so that if something breaks, then the orchestrator can can help you heal it and connect you to things that are within your infrastructure. And so to, to really be cloud native is not to just put it in the cloud, but to really embrace those, uh, those methodologies and technologies to, to maximize the, uh, the value of putting it in the cloud. Got you. Now I heard in this conversation, you this, what you just said, you just mentioned orchestrator. Uh, when I hear orchestrator, I often, um, uh, you know, thinking big picture here and then scaling down to have something manipulate something in order to do a deployment, which brings to another question, is CICD necessary for uh, a benefit for cloud native? Is that necessary? This is open to everybody. So I'll jump in. Um, I would say yes. I don't think you can really effectively uh, start to clear up the confusion that we were just talking about um, because the real reason the confusion is there is the terms evolved, right? Like it's gone from just, hey, this runs in the cloud to it is now this development philosophy that people try to adhere to. And um, it's tough because I would argue that CICD is another buzzword that gets lost in translation. Um, nobody can even agree what the D means. And you know that final letter, um, is it deployment? Is it delivery? Uh, you know, everybody has a different opinion, but at the end of the day, um, 
I think one of the pieces that's really kind of become a bedrock around cloud native is this concept of um, infrastructure as code and immutability. And so um, I don't think I've seen anybody personally, and this is anecdotal, be successful at doing infrastructure as code if they don't have some clearly defined machine driven processes to you know promote things. So uh, there's not a lot of purpose in moving away from the CLI if you're going to still sit there and take those you know templates that you've put together and manually deploy them everywhere. So I would argue that to um, do this at scale and to have some sense of you know sanity around it, um, yes, I think it is mandatory. But I'm willing to be debated. <laughs> Is anyone on the panel willing to, to debate that? Is that open for discussion for anyone? I agree with uh, Jeffrey, uh, other than my hello world uh, program that I <laughs> type and see. Uh, but in general, you, you do want that. It, having Being in cloud native does not negate good engineering practices that facilitate communication and testing. And these, these, these systems on how you deploy them into, into your infrastructure, having a good pipeline there that you focus on means you can get that audibility, you can, uh, you can get that observability into how your infrastructure works and re reduce or eliminate the uh, uh, fixes which are, which are manual and that are undocumented in how they work within the system. Right. So when um, we're talking about infrastructure as code, uh, we're also talking about uh, declaring and being in a declarative state. So when we're talking about uh, being in declarative state here, uh, for me, this is a, a, a question I have. Um, what, is it, what does it mean to be immutable uh, and have immutable infrastructure, in particular when it comes to uh, cloud native. And then the second part of that would be, what does it mean to be uh, immutable or have immutable infrastructure when it comes to defining uh, cloud native as a network function? So there's two parts to that question. All right. I, I, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, I mean, this leads into the CICD though, so one, I guess, um, I don't want to even say controversial, but maybe misunderstood or disagreed upon, uh, I guess, concept is immutable infrastructure when it comes to CICD. Do you need CICD in order to get to immutable infrastructure? We think so. We think so. So uh, I think our definition of immutable uh, infrastructure is uh, infrastructure that's easily reproduced, consistent, disposable, has a repeatable deployment process, and it doesn't have any configuration or artifacts that are modifiable in place. And, and uh, oftentimes people just um, concentrate on that last portion, no artifacts that are modifiable in place. But we really, um, as far as being any type of you know, operator that's, in, that's managing some type of infrastructure, you're really gonna have to go back a good 15 years to not have those first a couple of um, attributes, the reproducibility, consistent, disposable, and all those things in order to get to that, that final piece. So that's where some of these maybe definitions start um, uh, getting fought over, uh, start to be fought over. Um, and then um, when it comes to cloud native network functions and immutability there, I'll, I'll let somebody else chime in and maybe I can add in. Uh, Frederick, you want to take that? Sure. So once we once we start to drive towards uh, cloud native uh, functions, then and we start to, to bring in the uh, the CI CD system around it, we start to to build up these processes, trying to make it cloud native, and uh, so all of these work in to, together to form that uh, that system, that platform that is, that is uh, cloud native. And when you start to look at what do we mean by declarative infrastructure within that environment, what we tend to mean is that not that you're, you're specifying all the low level details. Instead, what you're doing is you're piecing piece things together that by themselves don't solve the problem, but when you piece them together, they have emergent properties which solve the problem that you're, that you're looking for. And you don't tell it 
all the, the minute details, all the things that are that are local, you, you keep them isolated into a local environment. Instead, what you do is you describe a top level environment. Please connect me to a secure corporate intranet, or please connect me to a video conferencing system, or or so on. And the system works with those things at a high level, and you're not specifying these are the IP addresses, these are the these are the, the VLAN tags, these are the MPLS labels that you need. Instead, you let the system define those and uh, and negotiate them and uh, and uh, fix them if they if they ever uh, end up conflicting with something that uh, that they shouldn't as as time progresses. Right. So when we're when we're thinking about um, how things progress and building out our our infrastructure and in our applications, uh, I, I really don't want to leave out uh, the the issue of security wrapped around all of this. Uh, you know, and and not just the security of let's be clear of just the of the network, but there's layers and layers of security here. We're talking about security of the containers. We're also talking about security of the network and of the application itself. So when we're talking about this, and Frederick, this is over to you. How how are you looking at security? Um, it it when we're talking about cloud native, how how are we looking at that? So. It's very common when people talk about security, they focus primarily on the privacy aspect of it. But generally, when people talk about security, they mean three three general properties. And they may mean more or less, depending on, on the context. But they mean confidentiality uh, is what I'm saying private, is uh, you have a uh, uh, availability. So is, is my system... Uh, online is, is there a DOS attack or something similar that can bring it down and there's an integrity aspect of it is what I have said or done or what my system does indeed what uh, what it should be it hasn't been modified um, and an easy way to remember this is if you take three of them you, it spells out CIA so it's relatively <laughs> easy to, to remember but um, right. in, in general when you start to look in, in security uh, and in a cloud native environment uh, the the traditional techniques that people tend to use in most environments is a perimeter defense. So they set up firewalls that control what comes in. They set up things to mitigate uh, denial of service attacks. They they use encryption to gain privacy and and so on. But uh, we're moving as an industry. We're starting to move away from a perimeter defense. Where what happens if the attacker is within your within your perimeter? And we're moving towards what they call a zero trust model. And what they mean by this is that your trust is no longer you're, you're, you're no longer implicitly trusting the network. Instead, you are establishing the trust based upon the workloads and some identity that is a, that is part of that workload. Uh, and one common technique now is to give them all X509 uh, certificates, which are cryptographic. Uh, certificates they can use to validate each other. So when two things connect with each other, then you're you're checking both identities, both from the client and the server. Are they who you think that they are? And establishing a private connection between the two of them doesn't mean you get rid of your perimeters, though. You know, those perimeters are still important; they're part of a layered defense. But the the network is no longer that trusted aspect, and it's an important shift that we need to move towards because the the dynamic nature of Kubernetes and other edge environments with how they treat uh, their networks and IP addresses, you can you no longer have the the flat uh, style network that you tend to see. You see a lot of, uh, of private uh, matted systems. You start to see a lot more private communication between two systems that doesn't need to break out. And so there's there's a new set of paradigms that are that are starting to come about in order to solve some of the challenges that we're seeing. That uh, where that perimeter defense is not service as well as it did in, in previous generation of technologies. All right, and so you 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 say challenges. I'm gonna I'm gonna probably label those as cost. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the cost of of implementing this? Uh, I, I I like to say end to end security. Um, again, going back to your CIA triad is what you were referencing. Uh, I like to associate the challenge equals the cost. Um, if I'm if I'm free to do so, so uh, Jeffrey, what do you, what do you think? Um, yeah. Just the overview of what that challenge or cost 
is uh, when we're talking about cloud native and immutable infrastructure and CI/CD. Yeah, this is a this is a very nuanced topic, um, especially in the telco space, and especially when we start talking about CNFs in the telco space. So, um, you know, the costs usually our biggest cost is opex, right? It is maintaining our network. It is getting lots of people with specialized skills to handle the vast scale that we contend with, you know? And um, that scale comes in a lot of different, like, you know, avenues. It's the total number of endpoints that we have in our network. Um, it's all the network, you know, plumbing itself. It's all with different vendors, you know? Um, I could have three different styles of core router in my backbone, each with their own unique CVDs and security considerations. Um, and now, as we move into this cloud native space, um, we're adding a lot of attack vectors, right? We no longer just have a physical box that has a limited number of inputs and outputs that can be attacked, right? You know, traditional networking, is my control plane safe? Is my management plane safe? Is there some kind of weird attack vector, you know, to perpetrate through my data plane? Um, now it's, you know, what about the web socket that, you know, has been exposed in this Kubernetes ingress? What about, you know, this um, HTTP request that's coming in on um, port 80, should we allow it? And um, it, it starts to add, you know, additional layers that now need to be accounted for that typically weren't there in legacy networks before. We would have a server form that's in this isolated space behind that perimeter that Frederick was describing. And then CIA is just like, you know, in and out of this walled garden, if you will. Um, I'm going to be very, very strict, but once I'm in the walled garden, you know, you know, legacy mindset is I'm not worried about that insider threat, et cetera. Um, so we said at the beginning, you know, one of your first questions was, do I think CICD is mandatory? And this is one of my primary reasons for saying yes. Uh, you know, I hate saying DevSecOps because it is one of the most fuzziest words out there, but in reality, um, it's it's super important and it's a cultural change and telco and web scale, like, to do security at scale and to cover all of these parameters that Frederick was laying out for us, it has to be baked in from inception and it has to be part of that tool chain. Um, you know, how do I onboard four different vendors CNFs and still apply the same security practices across all of them? How do I institute, you know, policy that is going to control what does and doesn't have access to the necessary you know, resources? And, you know, you do that by putting in a lot of hard work in the front and you make this decision that cloud native isn't just like a containerized application that I'm running, but it is a shift in the mindset of how I'm going to approach these problems. And that's, in my opinion, the only way, you know, to your point, um, challenge equals cost. The only way that you can make this cost effective is to get the necessary, you know, um, building blocks in place to then eventually be able to do this at scale and without having to hire, you know, 30 different, you know, unique security experts for every single one project that you're going to do. Yeah, and you said some very key key points there. Uh, I think she can be summed up as uh, compliance as code, um, mm -hmm. you know, also as security as code. And then also when we're talking about this is um, scaling this, this design, this infrastructure out, you know, so now we have uh, security when it comes to the containers. We also have security when it comes to just the physical hardware itself and um, treating that as immutable infrastructure as close as you can. You know, it, we're now, um, and you'll see this in some of the uh, different uh, vendors where, you know, people are wrapping APIs around servers. Uh, you know, you, you, you'll start to see that even, uh, and I don't want to just say vendors, I would just, I want to say even uh, when we're talking about uh, people who have uh, actual um, machines on prem, uh, they're wrapping APIs around the, that hardware. But again, that goes, that, that opens up another can of worms to API security, right? Yeah. Uh, when we start talking about that. So let's dive into uh, what does the what are the what are these challenges? Because uh, we're we're talking about bare metal here. What are the challenges that uh, a lot of telcos are facing uh, when we're talking about being cloud native and immutable infrastructure and uh, security? I, I, I'm I'm gonna turn this back over to you, Freddie. Uh, uh, I'm sorry if I called you Freddie. I apologize, but I'm turn this back over to you and uh, you tell me what what you're thinking here or or looking at that landscape. Sure. So, um, 
there's a lot of different ways to to take on this problem. Uh, some some of them are operating system based. Like if I establish a Unix socket between two things, then it's presumed that those two things can only talk with each other. But uh, what we're one of the things that we're seeing uh, pushed throughout the industry for around those APIs is starting with that identity that we spoke to, that we spoke about earlier. And once you have that identity in place, the first thing you can do is is the system part of my, uh, is it a member of my organization or my, my group? And once you have those identities in place, they help you answer that question. Once you have that in place, if you look at the traditional model of how these, uh, these type of systems are secured, they tend to drive towards like network access control layers. Uh, there might be, uh, from an API side, they may, they may start to put in uh, rules on what IP addresses a particular call can, can come from. One of the things that we are seeing a movement towards is to use those cryptographic identities inside of a declarative policy, where in a policy, instead of saying these IP addresses can talk to these other IP addresses and make these, uh, and make these calls based upon an application firewall, instead we're seeing declarative policy that is being written that you can state what systems based on the cryptographic identities are allowed to talk to which other systems and to put parameters about those calls about what is it making like is it, if you have a front end application making a call to a payment gate, uh, api with a uh, to a database then is that front end application allowed to is, is it was it designed to talk to that thing or is it is uh, something else uh, subverting the trying trying to subvert that security and making a call that's considered to be out of policy, and so this this allows us to describe those and keep a really clean layer of abstraction between uh, low level networking and the uh, higher level set of identities, uh, and allow us to to build up those in, human, in ways that are human readable and in ways that also allows you to uninstall them at a later time. You sunset an application, you're not afraid of removing network access control lists because you might break another critical piece of infrastructure. You sunset the policy, that policy is no longer rendered in your infrastructure and then you move on. Jeffrey, did, over to you, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts when we're talking about cloud native and security and immutable infrastructure? Uh, from a telco perspective, uh, what challenges or um, what have you seen? Uh, so Conway's law is always rearing its ugly head. Um, we have lots and lots of groups because at least in the tier one telcos and um, cable providers, you know, we're like small nations. And within these nations, there's tribes and these tribes tend to build systems that meet their specific needs. And it doesn't always necessarily meet the needs of the, you know, um, adjoining city states looking to take advantage of some of this infrastructure. So, um, you, know, you know, what Frederick is describing is kind of like what would be nice to get to, but, um, you know, the main challenges are um, brownfield. We have vast, vast amounts of, you know, existing infrastructure that is nowhere close to being cloud native, and it's kind of hard to bolt on a cloud native interface and get the two, you know, heterogeneous um, worlds to talk to each other. Um, scale. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. Um, there's so much stuff to secure now. Um, and not only that, but, um, you know, we always, like a lot of times in my experience, because I'm not a true security person, the security people always forget that availability is one of the key tenants in the security hierarchy, right? Like, I have to be able to access the system, I have to be able to use the system, and I need it to do, you know, certain things for me and perform. Um, and so you get into like this, uh, the last piece that we're talking about, the immutability piece, uh, one of the things I think that went, you know, kind of sideways on us in the previous generation of NFB was everything was infinitely mutable and every single knob was exposed at the lowest layers. Um, I used to nerd out like, you know, hardcore when it came to OpenStack and tweak everything they would let me to tweak. Um, I'd go in and I'd mess around with like some of the like, you know, underpinnings in Nova and try to get it to like do something a little bit different with the VM, bring down my cloud, have to recover the entire thing and, you know, my boss would be mad at me. Um, and I, you know, I'm starting to realize that even though I, the demanding um, telco operators, like I need to have infinite control of my infrastructure, uh, in reality, I probably need to pick and choose and just figure out, can I put this into this you know, pipeline that we've been describing over this? Can I take a vendor's um, artifact and put it into a system where I have trust that the security policies are in place to ensure that I'm not gonna get something that's gonna compromise me? 
but they also have a reasonable level of trust that they can provide an SLA on that because I haven't gone under it and start breaking things on it. Correct. And last but not least, Watson, any uh, any anything you want to add to to this conversation along yeah. those topics? Oh yeah, for telcos, as far as you know, the pain that I'm hearing a lot of the benefits of just regular continuous delivery uh, would go a long way. I'm hearing a lot of pain that has to do with um, not having a proper pipeline. Um, having, um, and we didn't talk about microservices that much, but uh, not having the different orgs being loosely coupled and developing uh, their applications, whether that be vendors or internal orgs uh, within the large telco, um, operating separately and having um, a different, since they all have different rates of change, all operating as product teams and having versioned uh, code and, and releasing that way, um, that all lands, uh, goes hand in hand with a proper pipeline. So um, after that, then having everything in containers or some coarse grained uh, delivery uh, mechanism um, or, uh, for your artifacts and then putting it in something like a Kubernetes or some type of orchestrator, that kind of thing. Um, yep. So, yeah, mm -hmm. and we didn't talk about microservices much, but maybe we should uh, lend some 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 thoughts around microservices. Uh, what does it mean to uh, to be in to be uh, in a in a microservice environment? Uh, let's start. Let's open up with some. Well, I should say end with some 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 things here, and that will be is uh, what does it mean to to have uh, your application. Um, as a microservice, what does that mean, and what does it mean to actually have that be secured as well? Too, and for in in reference to telcos, uh, I'll, I'll I'll open this up to Jeffrey uh, when we're talking about microservices and security in telcos. Yeah, um, I'm actually going to punt this one to Watson first because uh, <laughs> I think you need to understand what a microservice is before we try to put the uh, telco secrets on top of it. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. So um, I guess a, a good definition that we've been using for microservices um, for, for if any project that exists as a microservice, uh, it's not monolithic, it's resilient, and it follows 12 factor principles, and it's discoverable. So that's a, a mouthful. But really, with um, microservices, with there's lots of confusion and um, um, fighting now, it's really best to have a lower bound and an upper bound for your definition of microservice. So your 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 lower bound would be something technical, like people are trying to say, oh, it needs to be something that fits inside of a container with one process only, these types of things, some type of lower bound. Uh, but the upper bound, I think, is just as or more important and it's really the social side, the organizational side I was talking about earlier. You're really fighting, you're trying to work with Conway's law where your software is gonna look like how your organizational boundaries are formed. And it's really a prediction. You really, uh, you really don't wanna fight that. You're gonna probably lose. Um, so that's really the upper bound. So anything where um, if you're having one team develop software at a specific rate of change, they're going to operate as a product team and they're going to be responsible for delivering that software version software through pipeline all the way to the end. And um, they other teams are only coupled in as much as the uh, as the version of the of the software. So that's really having both of those would be whenever you talk about microservices, if you're not talking about both of those boundaries, then you're missing something. Great. And I think and the last piece ahead. for the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say the last piece for the telco side is um, you know, the biggest challenge is, you know, getting trust um, between all the different entities that Watson's describing because we have lots and lots of internal development groups that build, you know, and maintain software in house. But then, you know, as a telco, we can bring in quite a lot of third party, uh, you know, hardware and software solutions that we have to then integrate. And that integration is kind of the key piece. Um, you know, when I think of microservices, does the service stand alone? 
can it be maintained um, without bringing other things down, without other stuff taking it down, start to build that trust so that way um, the different functionalities can grow and be maintained independently while still not becoming, you know, the humongous cost burden of constant integration work. And I, and I, we ran out of time and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we want to leave some time for Q and A. Uh, I thank you, Watson. I also thank you, Jeffrey, and I thank you, Frederick, for join, for coming to join us today. My thank pleasure. you, Tim. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.